Good afternoon, everyone. Going to give it a couple of seconds while everyone comes in. Thank you for joining us today. Just wanted to say that we are pleased to offer this event through the Community Navigator Pilot Program and the U.S. Pan-Asian American Chamber of Commerce. I'm going to be sticking a link into the chat so that you can see more about that program. Oh, wow, those numbers jumped up really quickly. It uh, looks like we're at a steady now, so I will go ahead and get started. Uh, let me share my screen. Hopefully everyone can now see it okay. Yep, should see it just fine. Ah. Hopefully you guys aren't judging me on my desktop and all the tabs I have open. It's been a busy, busy week or a few weeks. Anyways, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lauren Simpson. Welcome to the session. I am joined today by my colleagues, Mike DiDonato, as well as GB Bajaj. Good, good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Hi. All right, let's dive into who it is that we are and what we're doing today. Uh, so again, my name is Lauren Simpson. I'm with the FBDC or the Small Business Development Center. We are a national program with over a thousand locations across the country and we offer no cost services to local small businesses. And they are no cost to you because your tax dollars have already taken care of our cost and fees. For the Los Angeles network, which is the network that I represent, we have locations throughout the Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. And you can see those represented on the map in front of you. Ooh. There we go. And again, what do we do? So we offer no cost business advising. And so you're able to sit one on one with one of our business advisors, i.e. a mic or a GB and get some specialized assistance in various areas. So from taxes to finance to business planning, marketing, you name it, we've got it. We also offer virtual trainings, much like the training you have joined today. <coughs> Excuse me. And so again, we're here to help get in contact with us today. You can reach out to us via phone, 866-588-7232 or online smallbizla.org forward slash new client. If you're out, reached us outside of the Los Angeles area or network, you can go to americasbdc.org forward slash find your SBDC. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop my screen share and do some quick housekeeping. Uh, for those of you who have joined us today, please be sure to put all of your questions into the Q&A. Again, let's keep the questions on topic, and please be sure to put those into the Q&A. The chat will be reserved for various links that we'd like to, and resources we'd like to share with you. Uh, good afternoon to you too, Lily. Um, with that, I will give it over to GB and Mike. Good afternoon again. Good afternoon. Nice. Uh, so, GB, welcome back. Um, Thank you, sir. I'm glad you're feeling better. Thank uh, you. Did you have time to prepare a presentation? If not, it's okay. There's, there's I do. I do. Off. There's actually a big thing that happened about the sourcing of income for a variety okay. of states. So, I want to talk about that today. All right, let's go for it. Perfect. Can you see my screen? Excellent. So the topic for today is Zoom to the tax bill. Now it doesn't have to be Zoom. The case we're gonna talk about uses Skype, but a lot more people, professionals especially, small business owners, have been doing a lot of business since the pandemic online. And because of that, one of the blessings that came from it was that now, a client who may be out of California can do work with us. But with that, also now we have a much broader tax exposure. There's a case that happened just a few months ago, which was lost under appeals where a Tennessee individual is now being sent a huge tax bill from the state of California because this individual in Tennessee did a lot of business with clients in or around California major metropolitan cities. So that is the topic of today, zooming ourselves to a tax bill. So what was this case about? Well, this was a Tennessee consultant. 
Consultants can do a lot of things, many things. And in this case, California said, well, you're a consultant. So all of your business activities are clubbed into one. This consultant out of Tennessee had engaged with a client, an insurance company out here in California. And what this Tennessee consultant did was provide training and consulting via phone and Skype to this client in California. The client actually did go to Tennessee to do some training in person, but this taxpayer from the state of Tennessee never set foot in California to do any business. It was all done in Tennessee or done via Skype or done via phone call. There was a case in 2019 called Bentley in which the Office of Taxpayers Appeal basically ruled that if a business owner steps into the state of California, they are liable to pay California income taxes, no matter where they come from, or if they deliver a physical product, in this case, it was, I believe, a screenplay for a movie. If somebody delivers a physical product to a customer in California, they are now subject to California income taxes on that sourced income. What's happening with this new case, it just happened a few weeks ago in 2022, is that now California is saying, even if no physical presence happened in the state of California, and even though no physical product was delivered, even just a matter of delivering a service to somebody in California is now going to place you on hook for California income taxes as a non-resident. Now, why do I want to talk about this case? Well, U.S. Supreme Court in 2015, I believe it was ruled that if a state taxes a certain income, another state cannot tax that income, which means if this taxpayer is on hook for California taxes, he or she could claim a tax credit for income tax that they may owe to the state of Tennessee. Do you think Tennessee is going to be happy about that? Absolutely not. So what are they going to do? Retaliate. You want to tax our taxpayer? We will tax your taxpayer. Do you think other states are going to follow suit who have state income taxes? You betcha. So if you are a small business owner, especially somebody offering a service of any sorts, you may be on hook. And this is especially true for those who are operating as a sole proprietorship as an independent contractor, or you're operating as a single member LLC disregarded for tax purposes. Others may be on hook as well, most definitely, but these are some of the taxpayers that are going to be even more on hook and we'll talk about that briefly. Before I go on, anything you wanna to add to them, Mike? Have you heard of this? Have you had other no, clients talk about bill. this? No, but I'm sure this will come up. Yes, so absolutely. Thank you, sir. So what's the takeaway? Physical presence is no longer required. Physical delivery of a product is no longer required. This, is, this case alludes to the Wayfair versus South Dakota, where the state said, well, if you don't no longer have physical presence, but you have economic presence, you are liable for collecting sales tax. California is taking you one step further and saying, hey, you're also liable for income tax because that's a new reality. People want to be a gypsy or a nomad. They want to always be traveling, doing business online. Well, we will tax you. What they're looking for now is how is a customer benefited? If a customer has benefited from your services, you as a service provider is now on hook. And this is also territorial because they want to protect California business. Tennessee would want to do the same thing. If somebody hires an accountant, I, I have clients in 35 states. I have to file tax returns in those states because I am sourcing income from those states. If I have a client out in New York, a CPA or an EA in New York no longer has a client. So New York wants to collect taxes from me because I'm taking business from their residents. So these states, they get very territorial over their constituents. So they look at how is a customer benefiting and they look at how often 
are you doing business inside and outside of, in this case, California, but also in their own respective states? If you just do one client, one year, are you on hook? Legally, technically, yes, but will they come after you? Probably not. But if you're working with a client for a month or two, you're, you're on a higher, on a tighter hook. If you have multiple clients, you are even on a tighter hook. So they are looking, at, they don't want to go after one off. Like you, you provided a hundred dollar service to someone. Are they going to come after you? Maybe not, maybe not yet, but there's an exception to that. And we'll talk about it. But if you are doing regular business and you're doing big business, whatever that big business is, you may be on hook. Also, they're looking at what types of businesses are you engaging in? In this case, this person just called themselves a consultant. Well, anything and everything you sell is consulting. So there, you have multiple clients, even though you may be only working with one client in one capacity in any given year. And like I said, they look at the economic presence. Are you digitally present and are you deriving an economic benefit from it? GB, we're yes, not sir. seeing it. We haven't seen the screen change. Mm. Let me see. What about now? Now we have it. Excellent. So this is where I talked about the client, or in this case, a taxpayer, and the physical presence is no longer right. required and all that stuff. Right. Thank you for bringing that to my attention, Mike. Sure. So what is the guidance from the Franchise Tax Board? They're telling us this, if, now this is just for California, but other states will most likely follow suit. So you may get a notice from other states. If a 1099 NEC is issued, you will get an assessment from the Franchise Tax Board. So you may have a consultant out in Hawaii. You may have a consultant out in Arizona. You may have a consultant out in New Jersey. Do you want to take a tax deduction? You tell your bookkeeper, your accountant, or yourself, you issue a 1099 because if you won't issue a 1099, this deduction that you paid somebody money will be disallowed. That ten, because you are a California-based taxpayer, you issue a 1099 to somebody out in New Jersey, New York, Hawaii, wherever, one copy of that 1099 NEC will be filed with the California Franchise Tax Board. That allows you to take a deduction on your California tax return so guess what? California will go looking to that taxpayer in a different state and say, hey, this guy out in California, this business owner, took a deduction for the income that was paid to you. They're not paying their taxes. Pony up. So even though you may only do a business one time with somebody, and this is the thing, though, you may have clients in other states, and they may be filing 1099s with the IRS and their local state tax board with your name, your social, your EIN, odds are you will start getting notices from these states saying, buddy, pony up. Our taxpayer took a deduction, is not paying taxes on this, 100 bucks or $100,000, you have to pay. Now, this also means if you are doing enough business, you may end up filing 5, 10, 15, 20 tax returns. But GP, will you get a credit uh, if you're for yes. your home, from your home state? Yes, you will get a credit, but this is where California is even more aggressive, where if you don't file an income tax return with another state, they may claim that you did not, you did not timely file a tax return, you did not timely claim a tax credit, so the mm -hmm. other state may come after you in two or three years, and <clears throat> you may pay them the tax, and now you try to take a tax credit in California, it might be too late. So this is where you may want to be proactive in filing multiple tax returns in multiple states if you want to take the tax credit. But whether you have an accountant or you use TurboTax, you have more compliance, you have to apportion income in all these different states. And we'll talk briefly about that. So this stuff is far more broader or it's far more broad than you can imagine. And whether you're doing it yourself, your bookkeeping has to reflect which state is the income source from. So if anybody comes to audit you, you may end up with an audit. Again, if you're big enough, you may end up in an audit. This Tennessee guy got audited in California. You may get audited by a different state and you have to show up there or hire a local accountant to fight that audit. 
So I'm not trying to, again, scare you. I'm trying to share with you to be proactive in your bookkeeping and maybe your tax filing. So if a 1099 NEC is issued, you can better believe that that state will come knocking looking for an income tax. Then they determine where is the benefit received. Now, this is especially true if you are working with a client, <coughs> excuse me, who has operations in multiple states. So this is where you may have a client who may be headquartered in Nevada, which doesn't have a state income tax, but they may have operations across the border in Nevada, sorry, in Arizona, maybe even in Texas. Now, Texas doesn't have a state income tax, but Arizona does. So you can imagine as you are conducting your business, the onus is on you to determine where is the benefit received. And that may require you to apportion your income across multiple state lines accordingly. And you have to have the records to back it up. You may also have, to, FTB is also saying, be very careful and define very carefully who is your customer. Because wherever they're physically based, wherever they are operating, wherever you determine that the benefit by the customer is being received, who is a customer? Are they a corporation? Are they an LLC? If they are an LLC, how are they taxed? So basically you should have a proper W-9 in your records. So the W-9 used to be, yeah, it's nice to have to issue a 1099, but now the compliance is even much more than just taking a deduction. Now your income tax directly is writing on it. And of course, where is the customer located? So all of this, where, who is the customer? Where is the customer located? And where is the benefit received by the customer will determine your income tax exposure on a state level. Anything you want to add to that, Mike? Just a bit of terminology. You're re referencing a 1099 NEC. Yes. They used to be known as a 1099 MASC miscellaneous. Correct. The NEC stands for non-employee compensation. So if you don't know what that means, yes. independent contractors now get 1099 NECs. Correct. 1099 MASC miss is meant for other purposes. Exactly. And this is where you're absolutely, I'm glad you brought it up because you may be issuing a 1099 miscellaneous as well. Do you think, for example, you may be paying somebody rent or you may be receiving rent for a property that you own in a different state. So all of these, the 1099 NEC is an example of the guidance used in this case, this Tennessee guy that just happened a few weeks ago. So this is where I'm glad you bring it up. You may be receiving a 1099 miscellaneous for other types of income, fisherman income, rental income, farm income. I mean, it's a whole plethora of things. So be mindful. You get a 1099 NEC, the states are watching. So of course, like I said, who is the customer? Where is the customer located? And where is the benefit received is what the FTB is suggesting. And I can promise you other states will follow suit to because California is very aggressive and a lot of times they set the tone for taxes for other states. You know, what if you don't, what if you don't actually issue the 1099 NEC, but you should have? If you, uh, good question. So that opens up a whole different Pandora's box because A, at the very least, if you get audited, your deduction will be disallowed. Now, here's the tricky part of it. What many states have done is, let's say if I forget to issue a 1099 NEC to Mike, Mike is my lawyer and he does some work and I don't issue him a 1099 NEC. If I get audited, I will be disallowed the deduction. If I paid Mike 10 grand, I will be disallowed that deduction. So my taxable income went up by 10,000. If I am in the 20% tax bracket effectively, IRS will say, well, GB, you owe another $2,000 plus you owe interest plus you owe penalty. So it can now, and on top of that, they will check Mike's tax return and say, did Mike report that income or not? Because even if, if Mike did not report that income, they will tax Mike as well. So they will end up making maybe, maybe double the tax and double the penalties because they will disallow for me and they will require you to do so. So in that scenario, the tax agencies win hands down. So cool. Oh, and by the way, not to mention even the bigger problem than that beyond income taxes, if 
my claim that I thought I was an employee. Now I'm also accused of misclassifying Mike's job description. So not only am I paying taxes and interest and penalties on the income, self-employment taxes as well, that Mike should have paid, I have to pay, plus a 50% penalty. So a $10,000 deduction can easily transform into a $12,000 tax bill. So file those 1099s. Thank you. They do by January 31st, correct? Sorry? They do by January 31st. Yes, correct. Yeah. Correct, absolutely. So moving on. By the way, any questions came in or we're good on that? There's a question regarding the ERTC. We'll do that in a little bit later on. Yeah. So this is a new thing, folks. Pay attention because this can cause a lot of headache down the line. Assessment continued. So then they also look after, look at the customer. Where is the customer located? Where is the benefit derived? They look at what service is being offered. Because some services are some services are non-taxable. So they look at what so a consultant can provide a lot of different services. So this is where how you write your contract. So this is bullet point number two. What service is being offered and what benefit does it provide to the customer? Is it marketing? Is it event planning, training, customer support? You better have good contracts, good invoices that give those details, because in the absence of those details in your contract or your invoices, the FTB will rule everything in their favor against you. So if you don't define all of these attributes, who's a customer, where are they, what service are you offering, what benefit is being derived, where is the benefit being derived, if you don't communicate that clearly, then FTB will make that determination for you in their favor against you. And where is the benefit received? For example, Maybe you're an event planner and your customer is based out in Hawaii maybe, or let's say state of Washington, a little bit closer to home. But the event took place in Los Angeles. So the customer is out in Washington, but you provided the benefit of event planning out in Los Angeles or maybe Las Vegas or wherever else, wherever else it may be. So. The reason why this is important, because if you are an event planner and you're providing an event in the city of LA, are you properly hiring your workers or not under the AB5? Because if you're not, that opens up another Pandora's box. So this is where one audit can lead to multiple audits by EDD. And did you properly do sales and use tax compliance or not? And that's where CDTFA kicks in. Folks, the challenge is right now, a lot of people are utilizing online services to do business across borders. And states are getting much more aggressive in how they define income. And multiple states get in on an audit because they rather just slam one person and collect everything and use the pressure to enforce compliance than to have disparate audits going around in different directions for different companies. So this is why it's so important to have the W-9 to have the proper tax reporting, to have the proper bookkeeping, and to proactively apportion income across multiple states, even though you may never leave California and you may never deliver any product to that person in a different state, any economic presence via Skype or Zoom is now exposing you to a potential tax filing and tax payment. CB, we have someone who does ask a relevant question. So this person asks, so each time we pay someone or an entity who isn't considered an employee, we need to make sure they receive a 1099 NEC if applicable. Correct? Yes, correct. You, yeah, but it's issued once a year at the end of the year. Yes. It's not yes, issued every time you pay someone. No, it's, uh, it's a 1099 NEC issued by December or January for all activities, all income, Pay to them for that for that uh, calendar year. Right. Yes. The other thing that comes up quite a bit, and it's something we need to discuss, is that there's multiple levels of government. Excuse me. <clears throat> and you have to meet requirements at each level of government, multiple echelons of government. Yes. So don't be confused about state requirements versus county versus city. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Just like minimum wage 
California has one, LA has another one, San Francisco has a different one. So depending on where your employees are based, you don't go by the California, you go by where the employee is working. And this is why where the benefit is received is also important because each county, each city can have its own HR laws and minimum wage laws. Absolutely. Thank you. People get confused about that. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. Okay, so the where part. How do you know where is the benefit derived? Well, the state will look at your contract specifications. If you're doing an event planning in the city of LA and you are hiring somebody out of Nevada and your company is headquartered in Oregon, well, the contract says the event will take place on August 17th in the city of LA, maybe in Santa Monica. So that's the where part, it's easy to determine. If the contract doesn't specify, maybe it's not an event. Maybe like in this guy, Tennessee, this guy was just providing consulting services, marketing, training, over the phone, via Skype. And in Tennessee, well, they look at your work orders. They will look at your bookkeeping. They will look at your communication. They will look at any and all records so that the state will now determine where the benefit was delivered. And if the benefit was delivered in, within the confines of the state of California, <coughs> excuse me, the state income taxes due. And if you do the same thing, if you are providing a benefit to somebody in Montana or Washington or somewhere else, you will have to be compliant with the local income, sales tax, payroll tax, all the different tax rules. If you have a situation where multiple states are involved, for, so I use a 520 rule, maybe you're working with a client that has 20 employees and five of those employees are in the state of California, which means 25%. So on that contract, California will claim 25% of income as taxable by California. So they will look at your employee location and employment records as well. So not only is W-9 important, W-4s are important because W-4s will tell the tax agency where is the benefit being derived. In this case, training. Maybe the company has 20 employees, but only the five employees in the state of California were trained and the others were in other states. So the contract was $100,000. Well, of that $100,000 contract, $25,000 is now taxable by the state of California which means they will expect a tax return as well. If there are no employee records, if there are no work orders, no contracts, no records, then the FTB will use some other sort of reasonable approximation as they deem appropriate. So if you won't specify, they will specify for you. And if there's nothing they can do, nothing at all, you are just so great and hiding your tracks that you will not leave any breadcrumbs at all. Well, if all else fails, billing address. If the billing address on the credit card that you made a payment on, on the bank account, on the invoice, if it has any zip code relating to state of California, California will levy tax. So you can see how this thing can get out of hand very quickly, very fast. So they want their money and they are getting more aggressive and they are going to rely on the 1099 that you are supposed to file to make these determinations and they will look at your communication and, and state of California especially has been known to subpoena cell phone records to see where were you present while you were making those phone calls. Not just cell phone bill, records from Verizon, from T-Mobile, from wherever, they will subpoena those if necessary to determine that. Now, of course, this is a Tennessee case where California is being aggressive. The reason I'm talking about this is because other states are following suit and will be following suit very soon on this. Anything you want to add to that, Mike? The where part? <coughs> Excuse me. No, this is great stuff. Well, I'll, this all comes down to documentation, as always. It all comes down to document. documentation, correct. Right. And multiple Just states will levy multiple taxes if you will allow them. If you are poor in your bookkeeping or your record keeping, just because 
just because you pay tax to somebody in Tennessee or somebody in New York or wherever, it makes you entitled to claim a tax credit, but that means you must have a properly drafted and timely filed tax return. If you don't do that, if any of those pieces are missing, you end up paying tax to a different state and California will still pursue you. So you will and, end up paying double the taxation on and it. And you need proof. And you, you need, need proof. proof. And this right. is where, again, this rarely happens, but it does happen, where California could claim, you know, we don't think that tax was due to the state of Tennessee or New York or Hawaii or whatever. So because we don't think that tax was appropriate, we will not allow you to take the deduction. The reason why states are allowed that leeway is because some states pay, some states have a higher tax rate and some have a lower tax rate. So they want to make sure it's equitable, equitable in their favor, not in your favor. So keep that in mind. So how much? The how much is a tough part and it can be a tough part if you're not careful. Why? Because you have to have good bookkeeping records. The most common factor used, especially in this Tennessee case, was the sales factor apportionment. What, because this Tennessee taxpayer had multiple clients in California and outside of California, they looked at, okay, what portion of your sales came from California? Using that and using that proportion applied to total net income determined how much tax should California be allowed to collect? And that's the proportion that many states use, the sales factor apportionment. And if you're not tracking your sales by state in your bookkeeping, it's very hard for your bookkeeper or your accountant to make that determination. It's very hard for them to advise you on what exposure you may have. So this is where whether you're doing your bookkeeping yourself or somebody else is doing it for you, you want to make sure you have the proper mechanism to track these sales. There, I'm not going to tell you how to do it because whether you use QuickBooks or FreshBooks or Xero or something else, they all have a different mechanism. Excuse me. But you have to figure it out. And this is why this is getting more and more aggressive. And this is the first time this ruling just came in a few days ago. You can imagine the implementation will be quite dirty because everybody's still trying to figure it out. This is a new piece of arsenal in the state's coffers and they will use it to their best interest. So you have to document, document, document your business doings, your contracts, your workflow, your communication, your everything to make sure you're compliant. And this is where the 1099 requirement is key. Because remember, if you are an independent contractor, or actually, let me say, if you hire an independent contractor who is an individual doing business as a DBA, you have to issue them a 1099. Unless, of course, you're paying them by credit card, then the 1099K may exempt you from that. If you're working with an LLC, it depends on how they're being taxed. If they're disregarded, 1099 is required. If they're a partnership, 1099 is required. If they are taxed as an S or a C corp, you may be exempt from issuing a 1099. But even there, if you're working with a lawyer or somebody in the medical field, even though they may be a C corp or an S corp, you still have, to, sorry, a C corp, or yeah, S corp, you still have to issue them a 1099. So 1099 compliance has its own set of rules and it's the most easiest cherry picking for most states to determine whether or not you may have compliance for tax payments and tax filing in a different state. California is setting the course for it and other states will follow. So the states are saying, show me the money. And if you show them the money that the income was sourced out of their state, they will tax you on that. So that is my presentation for today. And now I'm open to any questions that may come up on this topic or a different topic. <coughs> well, thanks for going through that. That's actually a pretty stunning decision. It's going to have huge ripples across the country. Not exactly. Just California. Yes. Wow. They'll, I'm sure there'll be court cases over this. Oh, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> there is someone who's asking an ERTC question. Okay. 
Uh, he opened his shop in January of 2020. Mm -hmm. He hired an employee that only worked two weeks before the COVID shutdown, before the COVID shutdown. He didn't have employees from April 2020 through April 2021. He hired four part-time employees in August of 2021. Will he qualify for the ERTC? For the months of, based upon what Keith, you have told me so far, for the wages that you paid in the month of August, and September of 2021, those wages may qualify for the ERTC, assuming you did not use any PPP money to make those wages, and you did not claim any sick leave or uh, paid family leave for those wages that they were paid out. So as long as the money came out of your pocket or the EIDL or the business operations, you may be qualified to claim the credit because the credit ended September 30th of 2021. Right. So that's why and you had a, only part-time employees. So, and assuming that those part-time employees are not related to you or your business, so there are those attribution rules, as long as they are not related under those attribution rules, you may be able to claim, and there's no PPP money involved, you may be able to claim the ERTC on that. Okay, we had a couple of questions come in through the chat box. We actually prefer that you put questions in Q&A because we don't always monitor the chat box. It's too hard to go back and forth, but I'll ask these. Gail wants to know, how does California, how is California made aware that your income came from California? Good question. The easiest way is 1099. If you issue somebody a 1099, or somebody issued you a 1099 from a different state, that one copy of that 1099, just like your W-2, a copy of that 1099 and W-2 is filed with that state's tax department. So that's how California knows. The other way is maybe somebody else gets audited or somebody rats you out and they wanna collect 10% commission on whatever the money state will collect, or you may get audited or what they are going towards, and this is not a rumor, this is not conspiracy, this is an actual thing. The banks are being told to share with the tax agencies the whereabouts of money. This is where the federal government is also trying to implement a rule where if, any, if at any time for any reason more than $600 are deposited in your bank account, digitally or cash or wherever, the, the government has to be made aware of that. All of these watchful eyes is going to make California aware and if or anybody else all the other states and this is where then see this is where I tell my clients in the court of law you're presumed to be innocent until proven guilty in the tax world you're guilty until you prove your innocence so if California Nevada not Nevada let's say California or Arizona or New York sends you a notice that hey Gail somebody told us or we think you made money in New Jersey Prove it to us you did not. The burden of proof is on you that it did not happen. So, thanks for that answer. We have sure. somebody else who's saying, who's asking about sole proprietors. Okay. So, he is working with BIM members who are also sole proprietors. Should he be giving them 1099s? Absolutely. If you're taking a deduction, so let's say if you are. Let's say you're running a band and somebody gives you $10,000 and they give you a 1099 and you give to four other people two grand each and you're claiming a $8,000 deduction on your tax return. If you don't issue those 1099 for two grand each, the state and the feds may disallow and you will be liable for taxes on the entire 10 grand. I, I guess we have to provide some additional information concerning 1099. So the specific rules are in place for the forms that you reference, GB. Yes. 1099 NECs, 1099 miscellaneous, miscellaneous forms. So I believe the threshold is $600. That hasn't changed, correct? Correct. Right. So if you pay anyone who's an independent contractor, and keep in mind in the state of California, you have to meet certain rules to bring anybody on as an independent contractor. Uh, anything above $600, you have to issue a 1099 NEC. And that's true for anyone in the country, by the way. 
correct? Yes. And actually, so, then there's also the 1099 DIV, 1099 INT, because the 1099 INT has a threshold of 10 bucks. So if you borrow money from your aunt to start a business and she lives out in Connecticut and you pay her $11 in interest, to take a deduction on your tax return for that $11 in interest, you must have issued your aunt a 1099 INT for that $11. If you paid her $9.99, you are exempt because it's less than $10. So there are, there are many different flavors of 1099. All of these different 1099s can tie you up in a different state for income tax purposes. 1099 NEC is only non-employee compensation. Miscellaneous is for rental income, fishermen, all that stuff. There's interest. You may be issuing a K-1, right? So that's another thing. Maybe you have a business partner. You and him or her start a business in California. And at the end of the year, y'all made five grand and you issue a K-1 for 2,500 to that person. Guess what? They have $2,500 worth of pass-through income from an S corp or an LLC partnership from your business, they have to file a California tax return to pay California taxes on that $2,500. So the 1099s and the K1s and the W2s come in many flavors, could be an estate. Maybe you have a family member who passed away in, in, I don't know, Nebraska, and you inherited some taxable inheritance, could be a tax liability in Nebraska. It used to be people used to fly under their radar. No problem. Nobody knew. But now with Zoom and Skype, especially after the pandemic, people have, are now doing business across state lines. States are getting more aggressive. Right. There is an exemption, I believe, for corporations. Yes. So you don't have to file a 1099 NEC. Correct. Through corporations, other Correct. than they have law firms and insurance. There's some weird rules. We got exactly. To. Maybe I should do a presentation just yeah. on the 1099. Yeah, it's I like do. a whole, I mean, yeah. I've done, I've spoken for six hours. Maybe I can condense it down to maybe <laughs> 45 minutes. It's because a complicated 1099 is, topic. And this is yeah. where if you pay somebody by credit card, you're exempt because now it's 1099K that the credit card merchant processor has to issue them, not you. And now, especially effective January of this year, even the Venmo is subject to 1099 requirements. So be careful. All these tax forms, you'll be surprised. I just had a client meeting yesterday and I was like, you know, something doesn't look right here. What about this? Oh yeah, I have this too. What about that? Oh yeah, I have that too. And I'm like, dude, you got to tell me all these things. Well, GB, I don't think that was important. Anytime you receive anything that looks remotely official, share with your tax accountant. You never know, and things are changing quite rapidly ever since the pandemic. Okay, um, great. We don't have any other questions. Perhaps I can do the topic for next week if you, sure. if you can do that. Uh, wait a minute, we do have one other come in. Yes. Can you please provide, okay, so this is a different topic and then I'll go and cover it. Somebody wants to know about the California Competes Tax Credit that's coming from Maria. That's like a whole different presentation I did once. Yeah. It's, uh, maybe You've we'll talk more about the future. Yeah. No. So the reason I'm saying that is, is because it's a much more involved topic. I cannot answer in 30 seconds. So maybe I'll bring back that discussion. Or Maria, I'm happy to answer that. If you have an SBDC advisor, have yeah. them connect Please with me. Please see your SBDC yeah. advisor. Yeah. yeah. Because it's an involved topic. It's an involved topic. And, it, and if they don't have the answer, they can reach out to DB and get the answer for you. Um, so with that, we have no more questions, GB. Uh, Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, glad you're feeling better. Thank and you. See you next week. Next week, we'll do 1099s. All the different flavors of 1099s. <laughs> That's a lot. It's <laughs> okay, a lot. Great. I'll cover some of those. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Mike. Bye, Lauren.